Well, hello there. Welcome to a Sunday School lesson. Glad you dropped by. We've got some things to talk about today, and I hope life is going well for you. We are in Explore the Bible right now. We're on session three for March the 21st of 2021. Title of the lesson is Worthy? Question mark. I'm coming out of Luke chapter 18. What's up? We are moving through spring. We had big storms last night and uh, a little bit cool today and trees are budding out and good things are happening because God is in control and he has you in his hands. And so as long as we trust him, listen to him, follow him, we're going to see some good things happen. So whatever you're going through right now, know that he's got a word for you. And he has a word for us today on how we should be coming to him. And we'll talk about that in a moment. My contact information is right there. If you want to shoot me a text or an email with questions or comments, you can comment below on the video. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do that and hit the notification bell so you won't miss a thing. All right, um, we're going to pray and we're going to dive in. So let's do that. Father, thank you for the chance to share your word together. Thank you for this medium that we can use to look into your truth, to learn some things about ourselves and about you and how we come together. I pray your blessings upon everyone who sees this video and ask that you would smile on us all. Teach us to be humble in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Huh? Sometimes we see things we like. Sometimes we see things we don't like. Sometimes we see things that need fixing. Uh, you know, you probably looked in the mirror this morning and, you know, ladies, maybe you did some makeup. Guys, maybe you shaved. Maybe you fixed your hair or you look and see things that need adjusting or whatever. Maybe you look and see things you wish you could change. Maybe you like what you see. I hope there's at least some aspect of that, but we don't want to get too far into that. But when we look in the mirror... What do we see when we look deeper than what's on the outside? Maybe we need a different kind of mirror to be able to see that. And that mirror, unlike the one that hangs on the wall at home, is this one right here that too often sits on the shelf. This is the mirror that shows us the things that are deep inside. And we need to look into it to see the things that, um, that God loves and see the things that really need changing and adjusting. And one of those things that often we see is the attitude of pride. We're going to look at a parable today in Luke chapter 18 that where Jesus contrasts, compares and contrasts two people, uh, a Pharisee and a tax collector. And we're going to see how he takes those two to paint a picture of what real humility is and how we should, how we have to approach God. We tend to, when we look at ourselves, we, we kind of like to replay our highlight reel. We oftentimes, we like to see each other, see ourselves better than we really are. And that was the problem for one of the guys in today's story. And so let's take a look at it and see some things that we need to look at in our own lives, evaluate, and then maybe need to adjust. All right, we're in Luke chapter 18, and we are beginning in verse 9. And he also told this parable to them. That's not what it says. Let me start over. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, 
I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, and he was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you this, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. He humbled. Oh, let me start that verse again. I can't read today. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. All right, so Jesus is teaching here, and <clears throat> he has confronted a variety of different groups of people as he has been in his ministry, and we see it in some of the preceding chapters right here. He, he has um, he's inter, inter, had an interchange with the uh, religious leaders, with the Pharisees, with those who think of themselves because of their heritage, because of their bloodline, because of their position, that they are favored by God. He's also uh, had lots of interchange with his disciples as he has taught, sometimes teaching them directly, sometimes teaching them by what he's saying with the Pharisees and others that he engaged in dialogue with. Sometimes it, the, the conversation that he's having with Pharisees, while it's for their benefit, it's also for the benefit of his disciples who are watching and listening. And then there's been just a broad variety of people um, the, the everyday citizens that he's come in contact with, some of whom he has healed, some of whom he has done miraculous things with, and, and some teaching and interchange that he's had with them. And all these things to teach you and me. It, we are so blessed that God, first off, would send Jesus and let him become one of us and do the teaching and the miracles and the healing and all the things that he did and not certainly the least of which is the cross and the resurrection, bringing salvation, making it available to us. But that he would have uh, Jesus' followers to write down accounts of it and then preserve it over 2,000 years that we might have it today to be able to hear and engage with the teaching that Jesus gave when he was walking on earth. God himself in human form. We, we are so blessed to have this thing we call the Bible and what it brings to us, the truth that it brings. And so <clears throat> right here, Jesus is telling stories, teaching a parable, and a parable is a story that may be um, an actual true story or may be just a made-up story to illustrate a point, but it always illustrates a truth. And so Jesus is using this parable to illustrate a truth of how we are to approach God. So he, um, interesting verse nine, he says, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. So he's telling this parable in a way that would condemn those who are listening to it because they're guilty of what Jesus is trying to teach in the story. <clears throat> And so he compares two men. Um, one of them is a Pharisee and the other is a tax collector. Now, let's look at what they're doing. They're both doing two things. And both of those things are good things. They're both going to the temple and they're both going there to pray. And so both of those things are right things that we ought to do. As we think about it in terms of our day today, we might think of this as going to church which is a good thing to do, and we all should be doing that, and going to pray. 
And we ought to be doing that. In, in Jewish times, in, in Bible times, um, it was kind of a common thing that at certain hours of the day, you would stop to pray or you would go to the temple to pray or go to the synagogue to pray. Um, we don't, in, in most of our culture today, we're not that structured because we understand that any time is the right time to pray. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. And so wherever we are, where, whenever it is, we can stop and we can pray to God. And those are, those are two things, going to the church house, going to pray. Those are good. So they both do that. But now here comes in the contrasting element that we see. The Pharisee stood, which was a common posture for praying. I'll tell you a quick little funny. Um, um, three, three preachers were sitting in a restaurant one day at lunch, and they were talking about the proper posture for prayer. And one said, the proper posture for prayer is with one's head bowed and hands folded. And the second one said, no, no, no. The best prayers come when you are on your knees with your hands raised up to the heavens and your eyes toward, toward, turned heavenward. The third one said, no, you're both wrong. The best posture for prayer is laying flat out on the floor, crying out to God. At the next table behind them, a guy just kind of leans in and says, hey, I couldn't help but overhear you guys talking about praying and all. What's the best posture? He said, most powerful praying ever I've ever done, I'm a lineman. Most powerful prayer I've ever done is hanging upside down from a telephone pole. Huh. Well, you know, there are times in our lives when the situation that we find ourselves in makes the prayer powerful. Well, this guy was standing and that was okay. And he was praying, but he wasn't really praying to God. Well, I guess he was, but he wasn't praying God, praising God. He wasn't praying God, uh, interceding for others. He wasn't praying to God for uh, confession for his own sin. Look at what he was doing. He prays and he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And I can just see him gesturing to the tax collector that was not too far away. What is he doing? He's bragging on himself to God. He is trying to convince God of how good he is because of his upright religious standing as a Pharisee. Um, <clears throat> then he, he goes on to uh, pile on some accolades of himself, saying, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Um, he's just trying to convince God here. Rather than calling out to God and asking for forgiveness where he's fallen short in declaring that God is the one who is holy and righteous, no, no, he, he's, he's having this idea that he's got it all together and God should be thanking him for who he is rather than him thanking God for who God is. He is coming in absolute pride before God. Pride was at the heart of the fall of mankind. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, when they sinned, Satan appealed to the prideful nature that was in Eve. That was the start of the whole thing. He said, you'll be like God. You'll be wise and you'll know all things, appealing to the sense of pride that was there. We oftentimes have problems with that. We think of ourselves as um, a lot higher than we should, a lot more righteous than we are, a lot better than we are. Remember the Bible says that on our best day, the best we are is like a filthy rag when compared to a holy and righteous God. And so we see a contrast coming as Jesus tells the story. Remember, he's pointing out to people who have this problem, this pride problem. He's pointing out that problem to them. And so he paints the picture of the Pharisee. And then he goes to the tax collector in verse 13. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, 
was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. That phrase, standing some distance away, means that um, I see in him a, hes a hesitancy to approach God. Maybe he's standing off. He is feeling very different on the inside than what the Pharisee was feeling. Um, standing a distance away was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. Why? I think because he did not feel worthy to do that. Didn't feel worthy to even look up to God, but just continued in a bowed state before him and was beating his breast, which in that uh, culture was a sign of repentance and contrition. Uh, this was him recognizing his sinfulness and his unworthiness before God. And he was saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Bottom line, this guy approached God in humility. The Pharisee approached God in pride, saying, God, look at me and how righteous I am. Aren't I a good boy? And yet the tax collector, who was someone looked down upon by society, um, scorned by society, hated by society, and often, yes, a sinner. What, how does he come to God? He comes recognizing who he is before God and comes repentant before God and humble before God. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man, talking about the tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Mm. There is such a lesson in that. We've got to recognize who we are before God. We've got to stop comparing ourselves to others around us. You can always find somebody to compare yourself to that makes you look good. You can also find others to compare yourself to that make you look bad. So comparing yourself to others is not what we're supposed to do. What do we do? We compare ourselves to the standard that we find in the mirror, in God's word. And there we find ourselves in a place where the only right posture before us is bowed before God in humility, crying out for his forgiveness because we are sinners. Are we worthy to come to him? Absolutely not. But yet, he loves us. Yet, his grace is extended to us and his forgiveness is there. And the only way we ever become worthy is if we are totally washed and covered in the blood of Christ because that is worthy, the perfect, sinless blood of Christ. And when we come to him by faith, receiving him as Savior and Lord of our lives, then his blood makes us worthy. And it's the only thing that does. And even after we are covered by it, washed clean by it, and in the eyes of God, worthy to come to him, we still come humbly. Jesus goes on to uh, switch gears a little bit. We don't know if verse 15, if this happens at the same time in the same place as the verses we just read, or if this is a different um, episode. But either way, <clears throat> they're bringing children. They're bringing babies. They're bringing children to Jesus. They would be the parents more than likely. And they're just bringing them for a blessing. They're recognizing the power of Jesus. They're recognizing the presence of God in him. And, and they want uh, him to offer a blessing to their children. <clears throat> and the well-meaning disciples who recognize Jesus' busy schedule and that he has lots of things to do. And remember, in this day and time, children weren't seen as very important. And, and so they, they really had no standing. And so the disciples are seeing this as a hindrance to Jesus' mission and, and his energy. And it's like they don't think he has time for this. They don't think blessing these children is important. And so they are rebuking the parents and saying, stop. We don't have time for this. Don't bring these children to Jesus. 
And Jesus says, says that he called for them. He says, whoa, stop. Bring them to me. Permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, what Jesus is not teaching here is that a child who is not able to have faith of, of their own uh, is somehow worthy of salvation. Um, he's not teaching that you uh, can't, that you can come to faith without uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, we're not even getting into right now the age of accountability and all those things and what happens to children if they die before they are able to make their own decision. I, I believe that if you are not able to make your own decision, I think you're kind of already in because we're, we're not getting into all that right now. But he says in verse 17, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Now, remember, this is on the heels of what he's been teaching about humility. So how does a child and humility, how do, how do those things tie together? Well, well, in this day and time, what would a child have to offer? If a child was coming to make a bargain, make a deal, they have no power, they have no position, they have no possessions, they have no money, they have really nothing to offer. And so I think what Jesus is saying is we got to realize when we come to him, if we're going to come to him in true faith and for his grace, we've got to come recognizing that we don't have anything to offer. That is just by his grace and our faith in him is the only thing that brings us into that transaction with him that puts salvation in our lives. We have to come humbly. We have to come uh, asking for his mercy, repenting of our sin, and, and certainly not with any sense of puffed up arrogance or pride that we deserve what we're asking him to give us because we don't. And so Jesus is teaching us right here that we got to come humbly to him. So the next time you look in the mirror, remember that you have to look at this mirror as well. And while we do see some good things, we recognize that it only takes one thing that isn't good to separate us from God. And so because all of us have that or more, then we can only come to him in humility, casting ourselves before him and asking for his mercy and finding his grace through our faith and nothing else. I think that's the lesson today. We're not worthy. And yet he loves us enough to cover us with the blood of Christ that through that, through it, we might be worthy. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for loving us enough to even allow us to approach you. And I pray that you would teach us humility. Forgive us of our pride. Forgive us when we think too much of ourselves, when we have puffed ourselves up and think that we are righteous and better than others. Remind us, Father, that we're all sinners. And we all need a Savior. And we only find the one, Jesus, through faith in him. Keep us humble, Lord, and let us come to you finding what we can't find anywhere else. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for staying with me today. Um, if I can answer any questions or um, just pray with you about anything. I'd love to do that. Feel free to contact me and I will, uh, I'll do that. Hope you have a great day. Stay humble. Let God bring blessings into your life and I will see you next time. Bye.